So I'm big about breaking down like really large goals into really small bites. Um, so that's what happened to me. I wanted to save about an extra $10,000 to finish off our savings for a down payment on our very first home. So for me, I was like, you know, $10,000, that seems like an impossible challenge. Well, let me break that down by month and then by week and then by day. And more or less that came out to about $100 for other days. So I thought, okay. you know, that's a nice round number. I'll, I'll just call it that. And that'll be my easy to yeah. remember, easy to hit goal. And that's how I came up it, with it. And I understand you're moving. So was that the down payment? That was that was part of it. Yeah, we uh, actually closed two days ago as of recording. And I'm moving this weekend. So you've caught me in one of the very last days I'll be in this apartment here. Oh, very cool. Congrats on that. That's super cool. And even yeah. for a lot of people starting out, like hitting that $100 a day threshold is, you know, sometimes it would take months or years. You're like, well, I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to do it from day one. And I don't know if you hit it on day one, but you, did you have an idea of what you were going to do to to hit that uh, threshold every day? Yeah, I definitely did. So I have been using side hustles in some way, shape or form since early college is kind of what got me through college, what got me a little bit of extra spending money. I used to save up on like swag bucks to try to save for a nice dinner for my husband and I um, when we were dating I would like take him out like once a semester I was like I have like $200 that's great so yeah. at the time like I was doing those on and off just to kind of gain a little bit of extra money but I was never like making myself work any specific amount at any of those side hustles so I had some of these streams of income already kind of at my fingertips but it was just about utilizing them more and committing to utilizing them consistently yeah, nothing like setting a, a goal and a really tight deadline to hit that. Like, okay, yeah. I'm going to, there's no sitting around and w waiting for the perfect idea. Like, I got to take action on this now. Yeah. What was the reaction on TikTok when you started, when you started the challenge? I think, and was it just for the sake of public accountability? <laughs> like, I want to put it out there. Absolutely. And now, and now I, I got to do the next 99 days because I said I would. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. I'm super competitive with myself. Um, but beyond that, you know, I can choose whether I want to complete a challenge or not, but if I stop being competitive with myself or I get lenient with myself, there's no one else to force me to do anything. You know, it's not like my husband was like, you have to make a hundred, you know, dollars a day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> support it either way. So, you know, so I wanted to post this to a community, kind of like what people do with, if you've seen the 75 hard challenge where people do, it's kind of like a mental and physical kind of like workout challenge for 75 days. Yeah. I see people completing that at a much higher success rate when they post it. So to me, I was like, you know, that seems like something that would keep me on track. At the time, I had maybe 40 followers. So I thought, you know, I'll post it. Maybe my friends will see it and they'll keep me kind of accountable. And then I think I got like 50,000 likes on my first post. And I was wow. like, I, I really have to do this, actually. <laughs> And then I had to do it and I did it. Yeah. There's no way, you know, if you post it and people start following you, you better, you better own up to it and you better do it. So that's what happened to me, which was good. Now you're committed. What, yeah. what was in that first video that you think made it go it, it pretty viral like that? Yeah, that's interesting. I think the concept might have just hit at the right time. Um, I think part of it has to do with definitely cost of living being increased. A lot of talks about like salary transparency and side hustles just kind of gaining traction, at least in the circles yeah. that I was in on TikTok. Um, so I think part of that was just the season of life. People were gearing up for the holidays. I think I started this late September, early October. So that was like the right time maybe to post. And I didn't even know it in terms of like people trying to save for that last quarter or that last third of the year. Um, and then I was posting because I the point initially of me posting was just to post that I wanted to keep myself accountable to earning. And yeah. I think what was intriguing accidentally was that I, you know, on the first day didn't list any of the sites I was using. I was just like, oh, and I did like some work on annotation. And then I did, you know, another site, a survey site. And then people were like, well, what's that? And I was like, oh, OK, well, I can share about that. No problem. I know all about that. I've been doing that since college. So I think that yeah. kind of led to at least some initial intrigue. Okay. I want to circle back to the social media content creation game because I know that has turned into its own side hustle in a way. But let's let's break down some of these that you were going through. You mentioned swag bucks, you mentioned some annotation. Let's um let's spend some time on, you know, the top 10 that you uh, that you tested out during this period. That's great. I can give you a list of my top 3 that I think I would recommend to everybody. Um I'll give you some ones in the middle. 
And then I'll give you a few that I only tolerated and maybe a couple that I did not like. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Kind of go from there. So the ones that I really liked, um, Prolific is going to always be at the top of my list. Um, this is a survey site that researchers use. Um, a lot of times they're post-grad students or um, medical researchers or psychological researchers. Um, and they're paying pretty well per hour for short little surveys. So maybe it's a 10 minute survey, but it pays like $7. Well, that's really good if, if you bring In it terms up. of an hourly rate, yeah. Exactly, right. So so Prolific gives you mostly, I would say 30 minute and under surveys. Um, it's just prolific.com. Anyone can sign up. I do believe that they are often on a wait list because of demographics, just because researchers are looking for you know, an even pool of a lot of different demographics. So if you apply and get on a wait list, that doesn't mean that your wait list time will be the same as me. When I applied, I had heard about it about two or three years ago on Reddit, on a, on a um, kind of like a side hustle subreddit that I was on. And yeah. I applied and was on for maybe eight months on the wait list before I got accepted. But I would say, you know, consistently when surveys are available, I can make anywhere from like 10 to $30 a day doing that. Yeah, my experience, I didn't remember being waitlisted on Prolific because it's similar, like a listener or a reader reached out and was like, hey, uh, have you heard about this? You know, because you mentioned these other survey sites or, or focus group type of sites, like, have you heard about this one? I go, well, let me go check it out. And I don't know, like all of the rates were in uh, pounds, like British yeah, pounds yeah, for some. Yeah, they're basically it's a, Okay. So I didn't know if that was just me or if I like had triggered some no, 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 you no, know, no. weird IP address. Okay. Um, but they do, what's cool is they tell you like, this is how much you're going to make and this is how long we expect it to take. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, it's only going to be five minutes and it's going to pay, you know, even if it's just even whatever. Even if it's a dollar for five minutes, you're like, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I can do it. What else would I do for five minutes? I can do it from the comfort of my home. Right. So that's definitely um, an interesting one. Prolific.com will... Um, we'll link that one up. It used to be prolific.co. I guess they secured yes, finally true, the, but I think they the got com. The com. You're right about that. Absolutely. Yeah, they're really good. I like them in terms of survey sites. I think they're the best. You mentioned focus groups. I do focus groups and I love them, but I'm sure you know and you've talked about they're not consistent, at least for me. I only really qualify for a focus group every maybe two or three months. But when you yeah. do them, they're so much fun. I mean, it's just consumer opinions, kind of like prolific. Like there's really no right or wrong answer. You're not like submitting work to be graded unless you fail an attention check. Really, it's just like, what do you think about this product? Do you like breakfast sandwiches? Do you hate them? You know, so yeah. who doesn't? I mean, as someone who's an extrovert, you know, who gives their opinion to everyone for free all the time? You know, what would be wrong with getting paid $150 to test out a product and talk to somebody in a group about it for an hour? So I love focus groups. I don't do them all the time just because, again, like, I think that you're really... It's hard to come by because they want to not have you do one each week. At least the, the site that I'm on, I think it's called Sago, S-A-G-O or... I yeah, I think, uh, yeah, S-O-G-O, yeah, Sago yeah. something. Sago, okay. Sago, yeah. And so I really only qualify for, you know, maybe one every other month. But when I do them, they are so much fun. And again, anyone can do it. It's just about demographics and what you use. So no barrier to entry besides, um, you know, I think you have, just have to provide like a government ID and an address. Yeah, so I think Sago is like the researcher uh, facing side of the business. Focusgroup.com is the um, yes. panelist facing side of things. Um, any other sites that you like on that um, user user studies or focus group type of uh, type of work? Those are the only two that I consistently use um, in terms of consumer studies. I know Swagbucks has them. I don't use Swagbucks for surveys. I don't think they pay a comparable rate to something like Prolific. So Swagbucks okay. is a site that has a lot of different earning um, methods, kind of like, you know, cash back, discover offers, playing games to hit a certain level. They do have a survey tab. And what I always tell my followers is, I think there's sites that pay better and Prolific's the top of my list for that. Um, I just don't think that they're paying enough for it to be reasonable or worth your time. You're doing a 40 minute survey for $2. You don't want to get paid $3 an hour. So you have to go uh, look right. at Win win for similar effort, similar work on prolific. It could Absolutely. be, you know, many, well, I know, four or five times that. So that makes sense. Yes. Um, yeah. What was funny? So my top three for um, for focus groups and kind of these paid research studies would be userinterviews.com. Um, mm. Really cool site. And like th these, this one and uh, respondent.com or respondent.io. I forget what it is. Um, 
like definitely like a business to business focus. Like we're trying to find product managers and, you know, software users, or like kind of more industry specific studies. But if you qualify, like, yeah, 50, 100, 150 bucks an hour. Um, I got well, the recent one was like 250 an hour. It was from field work. I don't think it was from either of those, but it was talking about, you know, business banking or something like your small business banking. It's like, shoot, I love geeking out on this stuff anyways. I did one that was on um, uh, like credit card rewards. It was like a bunch of me and a bunch of travel hackers like on on, on like a Zoom yeah. call. I was like, this is kind of cool. They're, they're sharing they're sharing tips with it. Like I never heard down, about it. Like, yeah, this is kind of cool. It's the funny thing about uh, focusgroup.com because I did a, a focusgroup.com like review video on YouTube. And I want to say like Google took down the link. They're like, we, we don't let you link to scam skites. Or, or some, it was like, Google, like, did you watch the video? Like, my whole thing was like, I just made $215 from this site. Like, I proved it's not a scam. Like, I'm sticking my reputation on the line. Like, it's legit. And I was like, that was frustrating, but That's don't want to fight. Hard. Don't want to fight no, Google can, too hard. I can, I can vouch for them too. I've been paid for them several times now. So, uh, not yeah. a scam as far as I know. Absolutely not. So, what you should know if you do sign up, there are three tabs. Like, there's like the super low paying or mostly low paying, like online surveys. There's actually a couple of those tabs. What you want to pay attention to is like, I think it's the middle tab, which is like those Quality higher paying. It's been a, yeah, longer studies. Yeah, higher paying, um, more, more in depth type of studies. Okay. So, um, that's, that's helpful. So, that's a couple different options. Um, and one thing that you talked about, Swagbucks, not so good for their survey options, but better for their game yeah. testing options. How does this one work? For their game testing option. I would love to, if you know, um, I've got an idea, but maybe you are more business and analytically minded and you would be able to break this down better. My guess is um, when they offer someone, you know, if you hit X tier of a game, a mobile game offer, if you're a first time user, we'll pay you $5. Then if you hit the next tier, then we'll pay you $20. Then we'll pay you $50. And the last tier is like $160. So, you know, you've got like a good $200 reward by the end of it. And is it possible to hit those without doing like the in-app purchases in the game? Yeah. I, I stick to not doing in-app purchases in the game. And one of the ways I do that is by utilizing Reddit. Again, I am a big, yeah. uh, I'm like a spokesperson for Reddit because I think it's such a helpful forum um, just for vetting sites and also just to kind of like, it, a lot of people help each other reach their goals in, in terms of like side hustling. So there's a Swagbucks subreddit just called r slash Swagbucks. And most of the major game offers that are on there, someone has done an in-depth review of how to utilize your time most effectively. So if you've got 30 days to hit that goal and you want okay. to hit the highest goal, here's what you should do right off the bat. Here's what you shouldn't do. And there's like hundreds of comments. People blow it like, yes, I did this and this. And yes, I wouldn't do this again. Or you have to join this alliance, whatever. I mean, it's silly, but it works. So I think <laughs> several of the top tiers for games there's been a few that i've given up on and not completed but them you know the fact that they tier their rewards makes it so that you never really like lose completely right so it's kind of a side hustle that you can do in a way that you wouldn't do for like a survey site or any type of work that takes a lot of concentration this is something i can do while i watch tv you know or while i'm in the car so it, it kind of falls into like a unique category of accessibility in terms of time commitment and um, yeah, I think Reddit's a really great tool to hit those those goals. I, I've used a lot of those those little guides on Reddit. Okay, so my understanding, or maybe my assumption of how this works, is like the game companies are paying swag bucks to deliver them like a really loyal user to their app, or you know, and maybe they're paying out certain certain thresholds. Like yeah. if they hit level a thousand within this time period, like they're more likely to make in-app purchases so we're yeah, gonna more and, and then, then stay longer yeah yeah and so and then swag bucks is like sharing a portion of that revenue yes. with yeah. with you interesting it has to be because not all of the games have ads so at first i was like well it has to be they're just earning so much in ad revenue because i'm yeah so much i'm watching so much you know ad you know i'm getting ads like every 30 seconds but only some of the games have ads the one i'm doing right now is monopoly go i think my offer was for 218 dollars total wow not an ad to be seen. So I, I I know there's a reason why they're offering this money, but to me, I'm like, hey, I can't understand it, but I will play and I will earn. Yeah, they got to be making money on it somehow. But that's know, absolutely. And so my, I guess my take on it would be, if you enjoy playing mobile games, you might as well get paid for it. But absolutely, you know, 
I mean, if you if the hourly input required to hit the th- top threshold, For like, sure. is that a good trade off, or is it just like, look, I w- I'd be doing this anyways, so I'm going to make some money yeah. on it. Um, I think part of it comes down to kind of like I said, it's something that I can do where, you know, it, it's, it's a situation where I wouldn't be able to do some other side hustles, things like watching TV, things like you ever been like waiting in a long line or you're like waiting for your food to come at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A restaurant. Like- That's when I can put in hours to stuff like that in a way that I can't on, on any other site. If I'm on an airplane and there's no Wi-Fi, well, I can still play this game. If I'm on a commute, someone's driving, and I'm in a long car ride, I just did this. I start. I played Monopoly Go for six hours straight. Why? Because there's nothing else to do. You know, and some of these games are kind of automated. So, like, this has an auto-roll feature. I just turn that on. I can watch TV or even work on another side hustle and have that rolling in the background. And- oh, my gosh. All right, all right. All right. I know. Yeah, and that's it's something that you can do from your phone versus like yeah. I don't know, like prolific. It seems like at least when I was doing it, like it had to be desktop, and some of the other stuff has to be yeah. desktop. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I promised a third, um, you know, paid research site, and and I never got to it. And the third one was called Rare Patient Voice, which is primarily for medical research. But it says in the you know subheader of the site also non rare. So like if you suffer from any sort of medical condition, rare or non rare, or if you're a caregiver to somebody. Who is the site pays 120 bucks an hour and has a bunch of different studies coming up. So that one is one that comes up on um, on our list from time to time. Talk to me about the data annotation stuff. This was one Absolutely. that really blew up in in terms of popularity during the challenge because people didn't know what it was. And I'll and I'll raise my hand and uh, call myself in that bucket as well. Yeah. So data annotation is one that I would rate a three out of five, just as my disclaimer in terms of accessibility and kind of like, is the work enjoyable to do? I would say most likely no, Uh, (laughs) but, but it's, it pays well and it's an interesting site. So data annotation and I'll group um, another site, Remo tasks um, are both in the business of training large language models. So AI, um, think of things like Google Bard, think of things like open AI, you know, chat GPT. Um, so a lot of it is kind of veiled to the, the workers in terms of like which ones you're, you're training. Um, and some of that is just because you're signing different disclosures that you, you know, you're essentially freelancing for one of these major companies, but the majority of your work is going to be editing and classifying and fact checking large language model responses. So maybe you're given two responses from two different versions of a language model. You're fact checking it for you know accuracy that it's not making up information. You're looking at if it was too verbose, did it run on and just give you way too much information that it didn't really need to give you? Um, was the grammar okay? Stuff like that. So there's a lot of different subsets within um, both Remo tasks and data annotation. You can get put on a lot of different tasks. There's more specific ones for people who code, which I know pay a ton, which is Amazing if you code. I don't. Every time I see a qualification pop up for that, I wish I did. Um, but typically, these will pay anywhere for like from fifteen to twenty five dollars an hour, in my experience. Okay, that's that's not it's not bad. It's not nothing. No, I don't think so. No. What's the primary site that you're doing this through? Data annotation is the name of the site. Yep. Data annotation dot tech. tech. Yeah. Okay. The one that I signed up for was uh, Remote Tasks uh, to try and check it out. And I was almost deterred. It was like, I got, I got to do it for the blog post. I got to stick through this. But like the onboarding process took probably a couple of hours yeah. worth of yep. just training the things like you had to do an editing task. Like that's easy enough. Like, okay, I would, you know, cross out this sentence or this is the way I would phrase that instead to be more concise or whatever. But then you had to come up with a prompt response on your own. And there was one that was factual, like, you know, make an argument for XYZ. I, I forget what he's like. Well, why should, you know, why should we cut NASA's budget or something? Oh, like, oh, okay. Well, you know, people are starving, so the money would be better allocated. Like, you can make that argument. But the other one was a, um, it was like a fiction response or like a creative response. And that one was like, dang, <laughs> like, I don't to, it spent, I, I, I was really proud of what I came up with in the end. Like, but 500 words was like, you know, pretty decent sized, um, you know, what I considered like the opening of a, of a book, <laughs> but it was like almost, almost through the towel. It was like, this is pretty time consuming. Yeah. I, I feel that way. Data annotation is super similar. And to me, um, 
to my understanding, they really do screen out a lot of people through that test, um, which is not to say that, you know, you pass because you have X, Y, Z, you know, it, but it is it is heavily geared towards people who enjoy long form writing, who enjoy fact checking and editing, who have very strong grammar skills. I think data annotation says something like, you know, grammar and writing skills and like critical reasoning are the things that they look for. So you don't have to have degrees, anything like that, but it is grueling work. So if you, you know, I don't know how far you got into Rebo tasks after that, but um, people who come to my page and say like, I took the data annotation test. That was awful. I can't wait. To <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's all that it is though. That's <laughs> what you, if you take the test and you don't like it, that's all the prompts and all the work. Yeah, that that minutes. was just a free sample of yeah, what you a, what's coming down the pipe <laughs> down the pipeline. So I, I think people think like they're screening me, and this is an excruciating test, but it's going to be really cool. And in a way, it's cool to be able to you know write interesting topics or find ways to apply AI that can help people. But overall, it is really grueling work, and I don't want people to be disillusioned by that. I think there was something that so you know we'll we'll pay you to do this training, we'll pay you to do this onboarding, like after you unlock ten or twelve different paid tasks inside the systems like well maybe you know should i stick it out long enough to keep keep doing the thing because i did an hour and they use some like tracking software like to track your time and so i think i'm at like 15 bucks an hour for my work there so far so it's like okay it's legit like they're they are gonna yeah. you know pay out based on that or maybe there's some minimum threshold that i gotta hit but i was like for a while nothing showed up in my dashboard it's like oh really is this is this still unpaid training but like, okay, like, so I did see some money get added to it. There was another one that uh, a side hustle show guest pointed me to. It was called Taskverse, which uh, I'm still on the waiting list for. And this one was uh, for speaking. It was basically like reading reading sentences to help AI get better at voice recognition was maybe my understanding of it. And so I'll... I'll have to test that one out and see if let um, me know and if see if I get off the wait list too. I would love to test that one. That sounds right up my alley. I love speaking. So, <laughs> all right. So we have data annotation tech. We have remote tasks and uh, and task burst, So they may be inundated with um, mm -hmm. with inbound uh, worker applications at this point. <laughs> um, any anything else on the you know short list of side hustles that you that you would do again or that you plan to continue to do? Um, off and on, I will continue to do um, reselling um, of clothes just because that's an easy thing to do once a season, um, at least for a girl like me. I've always got some clothes that I could get rid of. But what I found, um, partially because in college I was selling on Depop when that like 2018, 2019 Depop was rising and there was a whole kind of like stream of girls um, and sellers who were buying things from Goodwill, selling them for a higher price, stuff like that. Um, I couldn't get into that. And I think that I was just not built that way. So I don't think that it's something I'll do consistently, but I will try to do that. And I like getting money for stuff I would have otherwise, you know, just thrown away or whatever. Um, but when people ask me about doing that as a side hustle, I hesitate to say that it's something you can do long term without putting a lot of investment in. And you have to be very careful that you're not going, you know, you're not tipping over to to actually being under in terms of profit. I, for me, that would be very hard to track. So I stick to selling my closet and selling some furniture every once in a while. And it is part of my challenge for sure. Um, but it's not something that I, you know, am earning like a ton of money on, I don't think. Yeah. Well, if we, um, oh, we just had a full episode on uh, on furniture flipping, which was, oh, yeah. it was really interesting because my interpretation of furniture flipping was like, okay, I'm going to buy this you know, old beat up dresser and I'm going to sand it and paint it and make it look all nice again. She's like, if it takes more than, you know, five minutes of cleaning, like I'm not touching it. <laughs> it was like just straight up buy low, sell high. And I thought that was really, I really know. interesting. So I feel like I've, I've given myself a kind of unspoken rule that I will not put in a lot of money for a side hustle. So I think what happened, you know, is that I want to stick to side hustles that are either very low cost or free to start up. I'll call clothes I already own free because I bought them years ago, right? But in terms of, like you're saying, flipping, that's an investment to start out. And right now for the stage of life I'm in and for how much I want to track stuff like that, I just don't want to mess with that, in my opinion. But, you know, I know a lot of people do successfully, but I don't think it's for me. Yeah, there are people who go go big on yeah. Depop, on Poshmark, and they've got, yeah. you know, they build the systems around consistently yeah. sourcing and, and they've got the lighting set up where they can, you know, quickly photograph this piece on the mannequin and ship it out. But it's uh, definitely a grind, especially in kind of low 
low-ish ticket clothing items where like, okay, maybe my profit on this is 10, 15 bucks and I had to source it and I had to photograph it and I had to list it and I had to ship it. Where we've seen people have the most success in flipping businesses is where there's enough margin and people have given the threshold, like, I want to make at least $100 on this because realistically it takes the same amount of effort to sell the $100 profit item as it did to sell the $10 profit items. And I got to do, you know, I got to do fewer, less volume to clear you know, a, a much uh, greater profit number. So that's where I would look at the the reselling. But it's an important reminder to to say, like, well, the stuff that I bought, like, yeah, it had this purchase price, but it also has this resale value. And that's something that I use in my mind to justify some purchases. Like, well, if I want to buy this uh, this bike or this pair of skis, like, okay, yeah, it's, it's this much uh, amount today, but if I use it for five years and then resell, like, okay, you know, it's, whether or not it actually yeah. you know materializes, but but I totally do that. You are getting into girl math territory. <laughs> you know you are, but that's exactly what girl math is founded on. So you you really had to <laughs> correct support it. All right, I'll 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 take this as a, as a compliment. Uh, so that's the the reselling side of things, or just you know clearing out the closet. One hundred percent recommended as um, just a decl- declutter. You know, add add some to your wallet at the same time. Uh, what else for you got? What other side hustles did you test out? Side hustles that I didn't love um, were M Turk. First of all, I don't know if you've talked about M Turk ever, but um, I think it's short for Mechanical Turk. It's um, a subset of Amazon. Um, yeah, Amazon's they, Mechanical Turk. Yeah. Yes. Um, I didn't think they paid enough, honestly, and I I seem to not be the only one. So at least in my experience and the experience of some others on some forums I read, um, when compared to sites like Prolific. They just really didn't stand the chance in terms of hourly pay. So I, I tried them and gave up on that quickly. Um, yeah, mostly overseas workers is my understanding of Mechanical Turk. I used it as a as a customer early on where I had, it was like basically a data entry project, like, you know, copy this, you know, skew into this website and, mm-hmm. you know, copy the product title back, like really tedious stuff, but um and we had a guy who he wrote the Mechanical Turk review for the Side Hustle Nation blog, and you know he was his story was like, well, I had a, a newborn on the way, I was staring down the barrel of you know paying for diapers and daycare and everything else, and hey, this is backed by Amazon, this is a legit company, and he ended up making fifty thousand dollars over the course of several years doing this site, but really tedious stuff, you know, uh, you know, sure. you're making twenty five cents a task, and you know, you think about it in terms of your your hourly rate is something you can do sitting on the couch, kind of relatively brainless. But eh, yeah, your your time may be better spent elsewhere. Think about the opportunity cost on that stuff. For sure. Um, another one that I didn't like and that I won't maybe recommend are two cashback apps that I'll group into the, like the same category, um, which would be Fetch and Ibotta. These are like cashback and earnings apps for groceries. So if you scan different items in the store or if you buy certain items rather than buying a name brand, you get cash back. I had a lot of people in my comments saying they were earning, you know, hundreds of dollars, a thousand dollars a year off of Fetch or off of Ibotta. And I was really surprised by that. And I think what it wow. came down to for me was just that I do not shop a lot. My husband and I I keep us under eighty dollars a week for all of our groceries per week. Um you know, and so I think that paired with us really basically thrifting everything else in our life just kind of created this perfect storm of I'm not Ibotta, I'm not such as ideal customer, and I think that's okay with me, but it just didn't work for me. I know a lot of people with larger families um, tend to lean towards that, and I think that's great for them. It just isn't maybe as obtainable if you are a low spender and maybe you're a household of one or two, I think. Yeah, not necessarily... A side hustle. I mean, I, I still use these apps and maybe combined they're 25, 50 bucks a year. Like I'm not making a thousand bucks a year off of these, but it's like, you're going to give me money for taking pictures of the receipts? Like, fine. I'll take, I'll take your free money. It takes you know, sure. three seconds to, to do it. <laughs> yeah. But you, is it a lifestyle changer? Absolutely not. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, besides that, the only other one I was going to try was Instant Cart, but I don't know if you if you've tried anything like that. Um, for me, the market was so oversaturated that as soon as something popped up, people were snatching it right away, and I just was not committed enough to maybe like sit there on my phone and just stare, waiting for like the millisecond that's you know uh, seven oh. popped up. 
Interesting. So people are like, I got to, you got to claim it like right away. Do you think it's because it's a college town and people are like, "Ah, you know, I got to go do it? That's a great question. Columbus is growing pretty rapidly. Um, We were recently named like the third fastest growing um, housing market, something like that, like the fastest housing market um, behind Cincinnati. And then we were at one point the fastest growing city in America. So I do wonder if like somehow really it is just kind of like the season of the city that I'm in. But it, w- it was just absurdly fast. And I just was not as committed to doing that. But I do love grocery shopping. So I- I'm willing to give it another chance. <laughs> so, love, I, I, it's like therapeutic to me. I love grocery shopping. And go give it a try. Do you have the pie chart breakdown of what ended up being the, you know, a- out of the $10,000, like what ended up being the biggest piece of the pie? Yeah, um, definitely data annotation for me was a large portion of the pie. And then um, something we haven't really talked about yet, I I won't maybe classify it as a side hustle anymore, I don't know, is um, earnings from either TikTok's creativity program or doing UGC work or brand deals. These are three things that I was only able to do because I started this challenge and gained kind of like attraction and and a following. So. Those things ended up being a pretty big portion of my my revenue as well, which I was super surprised about. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of the hourly rate, you know, overall? And it's hard to say, well, I played Monopoly Go for six hours, but just because you're already, you're working full time, you know, it's, you know now I got to come home and I got to do, do this. I got to, I got to figure out a way to make my hundred bucks because my followers yeah. are expecting it sure. and I got to edit the video and like do all the other yeah. you know, behind the scenes stuff that goes into it. Like it's, did, did you sleep during this, uh, this challenge? I did. Yeah. Um, to begin with, it took me in the start, probably four hours a day of active work. And then, you know, at the beginning I was editing my videos and doing my voiceovers for like an hour. Now I've got that down to like maybe 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. So I, I at least have that down. A little yeah. With, with repetition, with practice, yeah, it gets faster. Get used to it. You get less scared of your own voice like the first couple voiceovers you do you're like i sound insane and then you post it and you're like no everyone sounds normal you just are full of yourself um so in the beginning probably like a combined five hours of extra work a day um to me that was pretty normal because i just um in this past year uh, january of 2023 i had stopped my evening job i was working as a server at a wagyu steakhouse so working two jobs back to back was pretty normal for me and Honestly, okay. the fact that I could do it in the comfort of my own home rather than, you know, working in a kitchen and, you know, walking around at my feet for another six hours a night, that was honestly a, a perk for me. So that's, that wasn't too bad. Um, towards the end of the challenge, anywhere from two to three hours a day, um, just because I, you know, I had the opportunity to work with some great brands. UGC work pays really well. Um, so that was a blessing. And um I was earning money passively anywhere from like five to twenty-five dollars a day off TikTok's creativity program pretty consistently, which was amazing. So this would be similar to like YouTube ads, like it's just ad revenue mm-hmm. based on yeah. your view count or subscriber yeah, count. That's exactly what it is. So they will pay you per a thousand views. Um, and I think it's anywhere from like a dollar forty to a dollar seventy per a thousand views. Um, over the break I had some absolutely ridiculous numbers. I partially because I ended my challenge. So my day 100 got a significant amount of views. And then I did a series recap that got a lot of views. And that was my first taste of like, I had had some videos go viral like early on and I wasn't in the creativity program at the time. I think you have to have like 10,000 followers. Yeah. Um, So the first few videos that went viral, I I had no idea what you could make off of ad revenue for that. Um, But then, you know, just this past couple of weeks, I've kind of had a taste of what large creators are getting paid which is insane. So if you can, if you can create, if you can find a niche, create consistent content, um, I think there's huge money to be made in, in TikTok's creativity program beta, but it's all for one minute or longer videos. That's kind of like their criteria. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, I mean, no, just the, the nature of the, the everyday challenge, like you got people hooked, got people following along. I want to get the next update and that makes a lot of sense. But I will say this, like you have mastered short form like that, is awesome, but if you can <laughs> translate that same content over to YouTube, because the CPMs are way higher in the stitch. Um, wow. So uh, even if it's the same stuff, uh, review content, like here are, the, here are the side hustles that I tried. Like, I just, if you want to play the ad revenue game, yeah, <laughs> YouTube is, is a better place uh, for that long form uh, horizontal uh, content. Good. Um, good to know. Um, 
there was an Amazon storefront element. These are like my top product picks, like kind of, was this an influencer program or this was like something separate? Yeah, that's their influencer program. Um, something I put a little bit of time into. So I mostly called that passive income when that rolled in. I probably put about five hours of work into it total. Um, and then just kind of let it sit there and still it's sat there since maybe October. Um, yeah. Didn't make anything too crazy off of that, but I was um, I was happy with it. I mean, for five hours of work, I think total, maybe I made a couple hundred dollars by the end of the challenge and I'm still making, you know, per week, maybe $30 you know, for a, maybe a one time or a couple time a year investment, I think it's worth it if you have the criteria to meet um, to get into that program. Were you creating, a, like, are you sending your followers to this storefront? Or this is like, when I was doing Amazon Influencer, I still am. Um, this is one of my favorite side hustles of the last 12 months is like, you know, create these little product review videos. Oh. Not, not a lot of production quality. Yeah. And then you don't have to do anything to drive traffic. Like they just throw them up on the product page. Hey, if you if you help us close the sale, if somebody watches your video and buys the thing, we'll throw you, mm -hmm. we'll sprinkle a couple percentages of your way. Yeah, this is the, I have heard of that. I, I haven't done that yet. This is uh, okay. similar, but it's a storefront where you can link whatever products you want. So for me, I was I started out just by linking products people were asking me about. I have a heated blanket. I was always turning on each night in part of my videos, and people were like, "Where can I buy that?" Done. You can gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. The storefront my espresso yeah. machine, stuff like that. And then I did a couple gift guides, um, like frugal gift guides, gift guides for um, $15 and under, $30 and under, $50 and under. Um, and I just left those up. So I, maybe I made okay. two or three TikTok videos on those um, and then just had everything linked in different categories on my Amazon storefront. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, nice. Yeah, D different ways to, to go about it. But again, create something once, create that storefront or create those review videos once and you know, get paid for them over and over again. So um, growing the passive income section of that $100 a day pie uh, and, and hopefully growing the size of the pie um, as well. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, UGC, the user generated content mm -hmm. side of things, because this is, uh, you know, I'm an, I'm an elder millennial. This is like new, uh, new territory for me. So how does this all work? So user-generated content is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Um, brands are paying people to create um, different videos or, you know, static posts, images about either their brand, their product on their platform, anything like that, um, just in order to um, kind of drive sales in a way that someone talking from the brand would not be. Like if you get a review ad on your page, someone who works for that company, you're like, well, why would I trust that it's actually a good product? But if it's someone that looks like you and there's just some girl in, you know, Columbus, Ohio or whatever, and they're like, I really like this product and it works for me. Okay, well, that seems a little bit more trustworthy. And I think, you know, kind of data is starting to show that, that is the case. So there's a lot of companies right now that are looking to hire UGC workers. Um, I've seen a lot of people play folios and start from scratch and kind of pitch themselves to brands. Um, I think it's great. There's a lot of great, great um, UGC content creators on here. I've been following one for years. Yeah. Did you have to do any of that or were, were the brands reaching out to you? This was inbound for me. Which okay. Is very, yeah. Which is kind of why I kept that in a separate category when I calculated it because um, at least I am this time because, you know, again, I, that was something that I didn't seek out, but kind of an opportunity that came to me. Um, but I have, again, seen a lot of creators on TikTok pretty pretty consistently making content and then pitching it to brands. So, like, here's kind of what niche I can offer. I'm a, you know, lifestyle creator, you know, wellness creator. Here's an example of some product reviews I've done in the past. Here's how much my rates are. Would you like to work with me? Yeah. Well, what's typical, like, if you're, if you're comfortable sharing? Yeah. So, changes a lot. Um, I think when I started, I was doing like a hundred or two hundred dollar UGC videos. Um, there's there's a difference between a dedicated TikTok and an integrated TikTok. Integrated being, you know, kind of like an ad read in the middle of a YouTube video, versus a dedicated TikTok is like this is only about you know this product and this is the whole point of that video. So those yeah. are two different rates. Dedicated being higher. I think at the start I charged like a hundred dollars for an integrated, two hundred dollars for dedicated. Um, and then there's also videos that you upload, UGC videos that you upload, and um, they will post on their social media. Um, and that is usually what I charge the lowest for because it was 
not cluttering my feed. So it's less sure, like sure. kind of, I don't know, risk, if that makes sense for me. Um, so, so that I probably charge $75 to begin with. There's a lot of people that charge a lot of different rates. Depends on your portfolio, how long you've been doing it. Um, if you're posting a dedicated or integrated TikTok on your own feed, um, it depends on how many followers you have. Right now I'm in contract um, with a brand for a few thousand dollars for one, um, okay. which is insane to me. But you know, now I have 110 some thousand followers, which is very different than when I was doing UGC work for um, brands when I had you know 10,000. So it's crazy. Isn't that crazy? Could you imagine, like, compared to where it was three, four months ago? I mean, it's, to, yeah, it's just now. Now we got a hundred thousand people paying attention to this stuff. It's been absurd. It's it's like I can't really like it's it's almost one of those things where like the human brain has trouble seeing <laughs> growth. I think I, genuinely, yeah. I think there's been studies on like how people just truly cannot understand like what a billion dollars versus a million dollars is. It's mm -hmm. so hard for people to grasp like exponential growth like that. And I think that's been true of me. Like I can't even I can't even comprehend how many people that is. It's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um well, you're in Columbus. That's like the entire horseshoe. It's like a hundred thousand people, right? You know, it's it's bigger. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, that's probably a good transition point to the content creator side uh, of things, and maybe that's kind of where the future of this goes. Like focusing less on the hours for dollars side hustles and more on like how do I get more views so I can get you know creator program revenue? How can I drive more? Amazon affiliate sales, how can I get more user generated content contracts, you know, with bigger and bigger brands? Like where where do you see this thing going for the next uh for the next 12 months? It's it's a really tough question. I think what I am struggling to kind of come to terms with right now is that there's a really fine balance between wanting to hit goals like that and wanting to stay true to why people followed me in the first place. So I have a year-long challenge right now that I started um, on January 1st of just making how much extra income I can make in a year. I didn't give myself a daily goal. Um, right now we're moving house, so I'm averaging like $30 to $50 a day, something low. But, you know, what I want to show people is that little bits consistently over time make a big difference. So I'm documenting 366, because it's a leap year, days no. <laughs> of um, earning um, this year. You know, could I say... You know, I'm getting to the point where I'm earning thousands of dollars or whatever on ad revenue and brands, um, UGC work. I could, um, but there comes a point, and I've seen this happen to a lot of creators. Um, you know, for years when I followed creators, I would see them, you know, kind of the trope of like influencers becoming out of touch. I think there is a fine line to be to be walked to not kind of lose why people followed you to begin with. So I owe it to my audience. They're like, I, I would say like 90% women and they're from 18 to 35 years old. So I owe it to those girls who are just like me. And, you know, a year ago were in my shoes, you know, wanted to make a little bit of extra cash to save up for a home. I owe it to people to show them ways that don't cost money to start up or you don't have to have a following to start up. Um, so I'm going to continue to do that. But I will post transparency videos. Um, each Sunday I post um, how much I made on TikTok's creativity program and from any other like path of income, um, as I would call it. Yeah, I... I think it's super compelling and it just, you know, goes to show this, um, you know, consistent effort really stacks up and kind of, I mean, I'm hearing, you know, uh, echoes of what Side Hustle Nation was in the early days where it's like, I want to be the guinea pig for this stuff. This was one of my like early hypotheses for the site. Like I want to test out, um, you know, selling on Amazon, selling on eBay, you know, <laughs> driving for Lyft and selling on Fiverr and doing freelancing and you know, all of this different stuff, and I'm, I'm going to report back and the results, what I like, what I didn't like, and uh, you know, hopefully, knock on wood, I haven't you know, lost touch because I think the curiosity like still fuels so much of it. But um, you know, going out and finding other people to tell those stories, if it's a side hustle that I don't have the expertise to do or I have the time to go do, I will go find somebody to to tell that story. But you're doing it in a really, really compelling way, and I think it's it's something that obviously resonated with this audience early on and has clearly resonated with with your audience um, so far. So make sure to follow along at Jacqueline Mitchell on TikTok. We'll link that up in the show notes in case there's any trouble uh, spelling. <laughs> but that's the one year of extra income challenge. Like you said, you get an extra day this year, leap year, 366 days of extra income. I'm really excited to see what the total comes out to be because I imagine 
it's uh, it's going to be big and we're going to have to do a, a follow-up year from now to see see what you hit. So uh, let's, uh, th- again, thanks so much for joining me. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Uh, do your taxes is my number one. <laughs> make sure that you are tracking your taxes and make sure that you keep an accurate um an accurate idea of how much you owe um, because you don't want to get so disillusioned with how much money you're making on side hustles that you forget to save the money that you owe from March. So that's my tip. That's right. Yeah. Take uh, whatever the top line was, take 25% uh, of that and and you mark that away and maybe more depending on state taxes. Um, Do you you get those questions like, is this taxable? Is prolific taxable? All the time. time. And what I tell and people like, is, absolutely it is. If the government knows you're doing it, you're going to get taxed on it. They want their money and they want it now, which is, yeah. you know, that's fine. But um, I have a spreadsheet in my bio um, on my TikTok for free um, that kind of breaks down if anyone wants to do a one year of extra income challenge with me. And it takes that yeah. total and then it breaks down automatically a 27% um, set aside for taxes. And what I recommend is that people throw that when they're getting paid weekly or whatever, throw that amount into a high yield savings account and let that build interest in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Throw it in that high yield account, make those estimated tax payments. There's no surprise come, yeah. come next year. And here, here's the other cool thing. Like as if you're going to be getting 1099, like you're an independent contractor, like all of a sudden, like the tax, you know, you know, to hashtag disclaimer, like not, not an accountant, but like as a business owner, you know, whether you're freelancing and you know, if you're getting 1099s, you the government considers you an independent contractor slash mm-hmm. freelancer. Like you can, you can write off more stuff than you would be able to as just a yep. W-2 earner. So Absolutely. make sure you take advantage of, of the deductions that come along the way. But I get that all the time. Is this taxable? Like, yeah, it's going to be taxable, but like, I, I, well, it's not worth it then. Like, well, yeah. like, you know, there's no such thing as a 110%, you know, marginal tax rate. Like you're yeah. still better off than you were I, before. The, the misconception of, well, what if this raises me a tax bracket? Well, it wouldn't raise you to a hundred percent tax bracket, so you still make right. money. Right, <laughs> you're still better off. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, super cool. Again, at Jacqueline Mitchell, we'll link that up. Really inspiring stuff. My, you know, just a couple of quick notes, takeaways. Like the little wins add up. I mean, you set out with kind of a big goal of a hundred dollars a day, added up to over ten thousand dollars. Even ten dollars a day would still be thirty five hundred at the end of the year. Like it's not. I mean, you think about what that would afford in terms of a savings cushion, in terms of a nice vacation, in terms of, you know, whatever it may be, those little wins really start to compound. And the other thing that we see in kind of a somewhat with common theme here is, you know, working in public or documenting the process because people love that behind the scenes is like the unboxing videos of making extra income. I think it's really, really compelling and has unlocked the UGC stuff, the affiliate stuff, the ad income earning side of things. And I'm excited to see what the what the following looks like uh, a year from now. So whether you're a first time Side Hustle Show listener or a longtime fan, I really appreciate you spending some time with uh, Jackie and me in your earbuds today. If you're looking for what to listen to next, I've got over 600 or almost 600 of these uh, episodes to choose from. You take your pick. But uh, if you don't have that kind of time, I, I also understand. So what you could do instead is take a more curated approach by going to hustle.show and answering a few short multiple choice questions. And I'll build you a personalized playlist based on your answers. These are the eight to 10 episodes on a specific topic, deep dive on a more specific uh, topic, the more curated angle for you. Totally free, hustle.show. And uh, I'll get that sent over to you. Uh, Big thanks to Jackie for sharing her insight. Super inspiring stuff. We'll have links to all the resources she mentioned in the show notes at SideHustleNation.com slash Jackie. You can also hit up SideHustleNation.com slash deals for all the latest offers from our sponsors in one place. And big thanks to uh, for you for supporting the advertisers that support the show. That really does make a difference. That is it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you find the value in the show, the greatest compliment is to share it with a friend. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen and I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.